Over 500 major building collapses occur in the United States each year. Fires, explosions, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, construction and demolition accidents collapse buildings, and firefighters respond to each disaster. So the fire service must train to conduct search and rescue operations at collapse emergencies. And there must be a standard operating procedure to ensure firefighters' safety. This video will show you a collapse rescue plan of action you can use. It will tell you how to organize and control rescuers at a collapse scene, how to locate buried victims in a collapsed rubble pile, and most importantly, it will show you safe operating practices you can use to reduce risks and dangers at a collapse. There are five steps to a collapse rescue plan of action. Survey and safety size up of the collapse site. Rescue of surface victims. Exploring voids. Selected debris removal and general debris removal. Naturally, the most important part of the plan is size up. Firefighters first on the scene make a 360 degree safety survey around the collapse structure checking for victims, the extent of collapse damage, and, of course, for signs of fire. Then, an assessment of the remaining building is done. What's hanging? What can fall on rescuers? And how can it be secured or shored up? Next, see if the building has a cellar. The cellar can sometimes be used as access to the first floor to search for buried victims. Later, the cellar must also be searched for victims. One of the most important actions an officer in command of a collapse emergency can do is order the utilities to be shut off. Leaking gas can explode and cause a flash fire. Flames spread rapidly in the rubble of wood and broken furniture. Electricity and broken water pipes present other dangers to buried victims. People surviving the collapse trapped in voids can be electrocuted or drown. Firefighters responding to the scene must be equipped with wrenches and key tools to shut off gas tanks or supply mains, and be prepared to cut off power at the electric panels in cellars or outside the building. The size up and utility shut off is often overlooked by firefighters first on the scene, rushing to assist victims calling out for help. The commanding officer must determine if size up was conducted upon arrival, and if not, have it done immediately. Since utility shut off takes time, a hose line should be stretched at every collapse by the first arriving firefighters, and any small fires quickly put out. In place of a handheld stream, an aerial platform can be supplied with water and raised above the collapse. At earthquakes or explosions, water mains may be broken, so booster or water tanks should be available. Fireboats can be used when near waterways. Search and removal of surface victims is the second stage of collapse rescue. Injured people lying on top of the rubble pile and half-buried victims calling for help are removed first. Experience shows approximately half the people rescued from a collapse are found during this stage. Surface search and removal is the most productive stage of collapse rescue. Most collapsed buildings leave spaces and crevices in the rubble pile. Searching these voids created by large sections of broken floors and roofs is the third stage of a collapse rescue plan. People trapped in these shelters have a good chance of survival, and this is where you may find another 25% of the victims buried at a collapse. When searching void spaces, firefighters crawl into large shelters when stability or shoring permit. They shine lights and look for injured inside others, and for smaller collapse spaces, they call out and listen for cries of help. Selected debris removal, or digging to victims, is the fourth stage of collapse rescue. Difficult and time-consuming, firefighters must dig by hand through the wreckage to specific areas, based on reports of where the victims were last seen. This is not a hit-or-miss operation. 
a fire officer must know how to pinpoint a buried victim's location by analyzing a collapse. To do this, eyewitness accounts of what floor the victim was last seen on are gathered. Next, the victim's location on that floor is determined, front, middle, or rear. Then, the collapse is analyzed because the slope of a collapsed floor can move a buried victim from where he or she was last seen. For example, if a floor collapses beneath a person, a V-shaped collapsed floor might move the buried victim to the center, in other words, the bottom of the V. A lean-to collapse might move the victim to the lower portion of the lean-to. A tent-shaped collapse might move the victim away from the top of the tent, or the middle of the floor, straight down in the collapse pile. A pancake collapse might not move the victim horizontally at all, but drop him straight down in the collapse pile. Tunneling and trenching at a collapse can take several hours or days. It is dirty, back-breaking work, but worth it when you dig someone out alive. When a buried victim is discovered alive in a collapse pile after hours of work, don't remove him unless danger from flames or secondary collapse require it. Instead, the person should be examined for injury, stabilized, given first aid, and then carefully removed by rescuers under supervision of medical personnel. A great rescue effort can be ruined if the victim transported bleeds to death or dies of shock. General debris removal, the last stage of a collapsed plan of action, is carried out by heavy mechanical equipment. Cranes and bulldozers remove all the collapsed rubble right down to the cellar. All known victims have been removed from the rubble before cranes are used for digging. But firefighters should stay on the scene and inspect all the debris before it is loaded on dump trucks. There is always a possibility of discovering a victim not known or not reported inside the building before it collapsed, such as a visitor, a messenger, or homeless person. The crane bucket should first drop the rubble in the street for examination by firefighters before loading. Each pile should be carefully inspected for bodies. Organization and control is one of the most difficult objectives to attain at a collapsed rescue operation. But without it, search and rescue can become a mob scene, resulting in injury and death to rescuers as well as buried victims. The best way a commanding officer can organize and control a collapse scene is by establishing an incident command system. This command system will coordinate the efforts of all rescuers at the scene, firefighters, medical personnel, construction workers, and police. Here's how it works. First, an operations officer is put in command of search and rescue efforts. Next, a planning officer is designated to determine if the size up was completed and if not, conduct one. He must also supervise victim tracking, which victims have been taken to hospitals, which ones are being treated at the scene, which ones have left the scene. This information is crucial when determining who is buried in the collapse and where they are buried. A logistics officer is then assigned a command function. The logistics officer must supervise the use of heavy equipment. Finally, a finance officer may be designated to record all costs of the rescue effort, such as shoring tools left in place at the collapse, cost of heavy equipment, and all mutual aid costs, which must be certified. Sectoring is another method used to organize and control a collapse rescue operation. Sector officers can be assigned to each of the four sides of the collapse. Sector officers may be used to increase safety of the rescue operation, or they may assist the operations officer in search and rescue, or they may be used to supervise one of the many agencies working at the collapse. Collapse search and rescue is a high-risk operation secondary collapse, explosions, flash fires, electrocution, asphyxiation and drowning are some of the dangers. Any of these hazards can kill and injure rescuers. So far, in recent times, no firefighter has been killed during a collapse rescue operation. 
to continue this trend. Here are safe operating practices you can use to reduce risks and dangers at a collapse. Wearing protective clothing during the size up, surface search and void search is important. At any time, the risk of secondary collapse, explosion and flash fire are great. At night, the collapse scene should be lit with flood and spotlights to reduce injuries caused by falling or tripping. Firefighters climbing on top of a collapsed rubble pile cannot see the safest path. Lights can really help. Instead of walking on the uneven surface of a collapsed pile carrying off rubble, a human chain or pass-along method of rubble removal eliminates walking on rubble and reduces injuries caused by falling. Flames spread rapidly in collapse wreckage. It's too late to stretch a hose line after the flames start. Cellar searching is dangerous. Firefighters can be overcome by gas, electrocuted in a pool of water, or drown in a flooded subcellar. Before entering a cellar to search, utilities must be shut off and rescuers should be equipped with a mask, flashlight, radio, search rope. During selected debris removal, but before tunneling and trenching, the danger to firefighters begins to become greater than the chance of rescuing victims. Before this stage begins, all firefighters should be removed to safety and an analysis of the risks should be made. All secondary collapse dangers, explosion and fire hazards must be controlled or eliminated. Buried victims' locations are pinpointed during this interruption and safe tunneling and trenching strategies are planned. When large objects create a secondary collapse danger, do not pull these objects down. Shore them up instead. If they can't be shored, withdraw rescuers to safety, then remove these objects with mechanical methods. When shoring, do not move or attempt to restore in place the unstable structure. This could cause a collapse. Instead, place the shoring timber or jack in position, barely in contact with it. As rescue work continues, movement of the building will tighten the shoring. Do not remove shoring when leaving the scene. Shoring devices are left in place. There are two innovations for dealing with a collapse. One is the use of a surveyor's tool called a transit. When directed at a dangerously leaning wall or floor, this tool can detect the slightest shift in the structure. Movement not visible to the human eye can be detected by the transit. The other is a sound-powered phone. The location of buried victims trapped in voids crying out for help can be pinpointed by this sound-sensing device. Now we're going to hear from Ray Downey, Captain of Rescue 2, FDNY's expert in collapse search and rescue. One of the things we've learned at collapse rescue operations is that three rescue teams are required for search and rescue. One team will dig into the rubble for buried victims. Another team will survey and shore up above and below the collapse pile. A third rescue team will act as support, bringing tools and equipment to the digging site. In addition, this team will be a standby rescue team in the event of a secondary collapse or explosion that could trap the rescuers. Another thing we've learned is a skillful crane operator can tear a dangerous wall down without causing further injury to buried victims or more work for rescuers digging. And most importantly, when tunneling and trenching for buried victims, never give up hope of finding a victim alive. A fire department is an emergency service, and we must plan for all types of disasters, even for one we hope will never occur. For example, when fire is the cause of collapse, firefighters are the buried victims. Remember, protection of life is our number one priority during a collapse rescue, and this includes lives of firefighters. Good luck.